It began as a cult phenomenon, then it caught on. Now a new game is sweeping the country. You will burn forever and ever in eternal torment. You are no more. The role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons debuted in 1974. It became a hit with many adolescents, but critics claimed it was an invitation to devil worship. The witchcraft, the demonism, the spells. And worse. It is not fun and games. The media set off a satanic panic. A lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. That connection has been largely debunked. It's nothing but a witch hunt. And the game has generated an unexpected legacy. This was a revolution. On a summer day in August 1979, the family of a missing teenager called a Texas investigator named William Deere with some startling information. Dallas Egbert had uh, disappeared from Michigan State University during the summer session. James Dallas Egbert III was a 16-year-old sophomore, and his family hired Deere to help find him. He was a computer nerd, and he had a large amount of hair and carried his little briefcase. I wasn't sure that I was being told exactly what precipitated his disappearance. So I said, well, I guess the best thing we can do is I'll go to Michigan State University and I'll find out for myself exactly what was going on. What he found when he went to Egbert's dorm room was a shelf of neatly stacked books and something else. There was a court board with a series of tacks. In what might look like a random pattern of thumbtacks, the investigator saw what he thought could be a clue. The shape resembled a building that was part of a network of underground campus steam tunnels, which students told him they sometimes explored. We set out with maps, and we started going into the tunnels one morning with press everywhere. I entered with the idea that I did not know what I was getting into. But he had a hunch that it had something to do with a game that was growing in popularity. This is a quest in a fantasy world of castles and dungeons, monsters and dragons. This world has become real to these people. It's all part of a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons, also known as D&D, was created by the late Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson in the early 1970s. It was born out of their love for military war games, and they devised scenarios with made-up characters that incorporated their interest in history and fantasy fiction. Gygax said it provided an escape. All of us at times feel a little inadequate in dealing with the modern world. It would feel much better if, if we knew that we were a, a superhero or a mighty wizard. The game is played in a group, and the guide, or dungeon master, you enter a very small room talks the players through the fictional, sometimes violent adventures they will go on. And each has an elaborate scoring sheet for his character, with points for wisdom and strength and the like. A throw of these special dice decide the outcome of battles in an intricate scoring system. Okay, Nothing is acted out. The real scouting. action is in the okay, mind. Now you guys are entering the castle. But some, including Deer, worried that while the action was imaginary, some kids might take it too far. You're leaving the world of reality into the world of fantasy. It advocated murder, decapitation. And I'm going, this isn't a healthy game. How can it be a healthy game? That game and Deere's hunch that Egbert was playing it in the tunnels made great fodder for headlines, but it was a dead end. And Deere went back to Texas empty-handed. It wasn't within a day or two that the phone call came in. And, uh, I was told where I could find him, um, that he was still alive. So we flew out, and I'm trying to remember his exact words, but he couldn't really say a lot. And I left it like that. Egbert was a complicated teenager whose disappearance was never fully explained and who later committed suicide. There was speculation he was the victim of a campus game called Dungeons and Dragons. But after a month-long nationwide search, he was found unharmed. Deere fed into the growing suspicions about D&D in a book that pointed to the game as a culprit in Egbert's disappearance. But Tim Kask, who helped develop D&D with Gary Gygax, says Deere was just hyping the story for personal gain. He was a publicity hound. 
And uh, he knew that he could hang it on D&D and gather a lot of media frenzy, and he did. Dallas Egbert is a tragic story. Brilliant young man, sent off to university at 15. It had nothing to do with D&D and the steam tunnels. Still, that attention set off an unexpected chain of events. Our stock took off, literally. We sold thousands of more copies within 90 days of all that stuff happening, and we were up in print runs. Um, that, that's when we took off. Sales nearly quadrupled the year after Egbert disappeared. As the cult game was going mainstream, Dungeons & Dragons generated interest in two conflicting groups, people who wanted to buy it and those who wanted to ban it. And televangelists took on a new crusade. They are kids like yours, like the ones in your neighborhood, kids who are turning to darkness because society has shut God out. Conservative fundamentalist Christian group would see a game that involved satanic figures, evil figures, that would be a source of concern. Dungeons and Dragons has been called the most effective introduction to the occult in the history of man. It is a fantasy role-playing game that teaches demonology, witchcraft. Gygax, a religious man himself, was put on the defensive. The company hired psychologist Dr. Joyce Brothers to fend off criticism. There is good and evil in life. And the way Dungeons & Dragons is set up is that good triumphs over evil. Tim Kask says that in private, he and Gygax couldn't believe the game was being linked to devil worship. Without sounding disrespectful at all, we laughed our butts off most of the time. Because it was like, are you kidding me? You really think we're teaching your children demonology? But the controversy grew after the news media reported that a string of teen murders and suicides had one thing in common. The killers or victims were D&D players. Mary Towie was killed by two friends, Ron Adcox and Darren Molitor. The so, crucial point uh, is, can a game create psychosis, or is someone like Darren Molitor an accident waiting to happen, with or without the game? If you found 12 kids in murder-suicide with, with one connecting factor in each of them, wouldn't you question it? And that's all people would do. I would certainly do it in a scientific manner, and this is as unscientific as you can get. It's nothing but a witch hunt. But many grieving parents believed there was a connection. Pat Pulling's teenage son committed suicide, and she spoke publicly, claiming that his game plane contributed to his death. These children not only begin to have violent dreams or violent thoughts or negative, depressing type things, they become very much a part of this character. Young people commit suicide for a whole variety of reasons. In my research, I saw nothing that led anyone towards depression or suicide. Northwestern University professor of sociology, Gary Allen Fine, wrote a book called Shared Fantasy and studied the D&D subculture. They were the kind of kids and young people who didn't go to dances or date uh, on the weekends. They was part of a, a nerd culture, I guess you would say. I can still throw death spells, huh, Steve? The D&D culture intrigued filmmakers and fiction writers. Rona Jaffe's book, Mazes and Monsters, was loosely based on what people thought had happened to Dallas Egbert. It was made into a movie starring a young Tom Hanks. Let the journey begin. <laughs> Well, which way do we go? They went down the storm tunnels and got to play D and D in the in the tunnels. We had to like sit around a table. Like like, how awesome would it have been if it turned out that D and D was like what they did? Corey Doctorow is a writer and activist who early on was profiled as an avid D and D player in this story from 1985. The moral panic was mostly laughable. The idea that there were people who were fundamentalist Christians for whom Dungeons and Dragons represented some kind of existential threat to my soul was silly. You could go around and, and have uh, really satisfying arguments with like profoundly ignorant grown-ups. Over time, the Dungeons and Dragons controversy lost steam. And today, the common thread between D&D players is less likely to include any reported links to violence and more likely to involve Emmy Awards and literary prizes. Stephen Colbert and writers Ta-Nehisi Coates and Juno Diaz are among the millions of smart, bookish kids who played D&D and shrugged off any sense of panic. People were bananas. 
my mom moral panic. She was way more worried of us getting shanked, you know, or getting caught up in some nonsense. It was a lot of fun. It also provided them um, a variety of other skills, leadership skills, negotiation skills. We helped each other without even knowing it, man. I learned an enormous amount about what it meant to be courageous and what it meant to be passionate and the kind of moral, hard moral choices that one needs to make in real life in this kind of fake, sort of imagined plane of action. And for Diaz, as a young immigrant from the Dominican Republic, the game had special meaning. This was a revolution, being a bunch of kids of color in a society that tells us that we are nothing, being permitted and are under our own power to be heroic, to have agency, to do the hero stuff, to take and be on adventures. It's, there was nothing like it for us. It was very, 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 very impactful. While some parents used to worry about what kids were playing, now they're more likely to be worried about how they're playing. Cell phones and social media have revolutionized the way we live, but how has plugging in changed the way your kids are growing up? Through the 20th century, you have this tension between free play and controlled media. I mean, that we were concerned about what sitting in darkened movie theaters would do to our children. Just wait 30 years, and they will be worried about what their children are doing. And it will no doubt be something different than sexting and bullying uh, as we know it today. This is not a new phenomenon. This, it just changes with each new technology. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that in this media-saturated age, it's important for kids to use their imaginations in free play. And in a twist, the role-playing games that set off a moral panic in the past may look more like a solution than a problem to today's parents. It's a great thing to dream yourself in other places, and it helps understand who you are. It's just nice to spend a lot of time thinking, imagining, in a group, collaborating. Imagination is a good thing, man. Very powerful.